welcome to a special interview for The Wire. The Prime Minister has repeatedly claimed that by 2047, India will be fixed, in other words, a high-income developed country. But now a former member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council has said he's worried that India could get stuck in what's called a middle-income trap and never become a high-income country. What is that fear based upon? What does it mean for our future? And what do we need to do about it? Joining me with his answers is the former managing director of the Overseas Development Institute, Ratin Roy. Ratin Roy, in an article you wrote for the Economic Times the day before yesterday, you say you are increasingly scared that India could get caught in a middle income trap and fail to become a high income developed country. You write, and I'm quoting, I have been worried that conditions of India's economic development are increasingly signaling the approach of a middle income trap. The typical fate of a middle income country is to stay there and not achieve high income status. Can you start by explaining why do you fear this might happen to India? Thank you, Karan. Uh, I've actually been saying this, I think, including on your program since 2019. And nothing has happened since to convince me that we have done stuff that will prevent what happens to most countries in the world. Let me start by explaining that. I'm from Bombay. So I look, I'm, and actually I grew up around Bollywood. So I often use movies as an analogy. So if you look at development as a movie, you start poor, you become somewhat developed, and you then become rich. I have to tell your viewers, regrettably, that that movie typically has a sad ending. And the happy ending movies like China, like South Korea, like France, are relatively few. And the sad ending movies, uh, already, like Brazil, Argentina, Turkey, Mexico, Egypt, and the Philippines, are typically the norm. So far, I was optimistic that India was, at least had the possibility of a happy ending in this movie. What is a happy ending as opposed to a sad ending? When you're poor, everyone is by and large poor. You know, we both grew up in a poor country. You learn whether you were relatively rich or not to make do without to some extent, and uh, you did not have aspirations to live lifestyles like those in rich countries did. As you move into middle income status, the challenge differs. Uh, you know, people don't die of hunger anymore. They don't in India, by and large. Uh, people have basic necessities or they increase their access to them, either through subsidy or otherwise, by and large. But what also happens as a country becomes relatively rich, which is what we call moving from low to middle income status, is that people like us, the top 10 or 20 percent of the population, start living at standards of living that approximate those in rich countries. Now, there's a fork in that road that happens as you transform, which determines whether your movie will end as a tragedy or happily. That fork in the road is are more and more people's prosperity increasing? Or is it that the top 20% of a population, the top quarter of a population, their prosperity goes on increasing to high income levels while the rest remain mired with the basic necessities of life, but nothing more? That translates in macro terms into the difference between a high income and a middle income country. In a high income country, the majority of the population lives prosperous. And that implies a per capita income of more than $15,000 per capita. India is at $3,000. Countries like Turkey, like Brazil, like uh, uh, Egypt, like Philippines, their per capita income starts stagnating somewhere between left seven and 10 or $11,000 per capita. They have 20% rich people. They have 80% poor people, and they stay there in the foreseeable future, in, in perpetuity almost, as we have seen in the case of Brazil, 30 years now, Philippines, 30 years now, reached middle income, didn't make it to high income. What does that mean in real terms when you, when you look at a country like that? What it means is when you go to a country like that, and I've lived in Brazil, and I've seen it, it means the top 20% of the country lives extremely luxurious lives. 
They have the best wine possible. They have the best food possible. The best possible Medicare. They have great education. Either they buy it abroad or they develop it at high prices in their own country. But three quarters of the population lives as if they lived in a poor country, as if the country had never moved to middle income status. So all the problems that a poor country has still exist for a large proportion of the population. Poverty, malnutrition, high crime, uh, poor education, poor health care, stunting. That is what is defined as a middle income trap. And, that's and that is the trap I'm afraid India is now moving to. That is the trap you feel India is moving into and that is the trap you fear India could get stuck in because the headline of your article, and I'm holding it up for the audience, there it is, was stuck in the middle forever. And as you pointed out, there are three key consequences that emerge if you get stuck in the middle income track forever. First, as you said, like Egypt, Brazil and Turkey, we will never become fixed. We may reach per capita incomes of somewhere between seven and 10,000, but we'll stop and stagnate there. Secondly, as you pointed out, 25% of Indians, that's a quarter of the population, will enjoy prosperous lives, but the majority, that 75%, will continue to be poor like their forefathers. But there is a third consequence, which you mentioned in the Economic Times, which I want to highlight as well. The potential for increased regional, ethnic and gender inequality means that this could challenge what you call the unity and integrity of India. So what's at stake if we get caught in the middle income trap is not just India's dreams. They won't fructify. They won't be realized, but also possibly our survival as a country, as a united country. That too could be at stake. So the prospect of being stuck in the middle income is a dire prospect. It is indeed. And if I may, let me explain the third point I made. Because as an Indian, uh, I am that worries me the most. I've spent my life in public service trying to serve this country called India. Not Bharat, as defined by some, and not India as defined by the rich in South Bombay, but this larger country called India. The trouble with what has happened in the course of development, especially since 1991, is something that no country in the last 100 years has been able to withstand, which is the majority of the country is poor and lives in geographies that are poor. The minority of the country is rich and lives in geographies that are rich. And these geographies are almost perfectly neatly separated. Broadly speaking, peninsular India, from Gujarat to Tamil Nadu, has per capita incomes which approximate something like $3,000, $3,300. Right? That's approaching the next poorest country in the G20, which is Indonesia. But where the majority of our population lives, which I call the Great Indian Plain, which is the belt, you know, from the Pakistan border, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, West Bengal, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh, that region earns less than the per capita income of Nepal, which I think everyone would acknowledge is a very poor country. So in the same space, in the same nation state, you have this huge income disparity, which is exacerbated by the fact that the South, the peninsula, is where people go for employment. We call them migrant laborers, however, because when they go to the peninsula, they do not become peninsular Indians. They continue in their own country to be migrants. So labor moves, but things are not equalized because the population of the North goes down in, peninsula, in the Great Indian Plain, the population of the South goes up because they continue to be migrants. One, two, capital is moving from the North and the East of India to the South, which is prosperous. Uh, that can be measured very simply by something we use uh, called the credit deposit ratio. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for, let me put it this way, for every 100 rupees that Biharis deposit in banks in Bihar, which is my capital, less than 70 rupees is invested in Bihar. And that is also true for UP, that is true for Madhya Pradesh, that is true for Rajasthan. For every 100 rupees that is deposited in banks in Tamil Nadu, more than 100 rupees, something like 122 rupees, is invested in Tamil Nadu. So capital is moving from the north 
to where there are opportunities in the South. This process is sadly fairly unique in terms of it has happened, and I'll explain that in a second. But if you look at typical countries which have rich and poor regions, take the United States. The rich regions are also the high population regions. New York, Illinois, California, Texas. Take Europe as a, as a continent. The rich populations live in the, major, the majority population areas are the rich areas, France, Germany, etc. And the relatively poor areas are Portugal, Spain, Ireland, etc. So it's easy for the rich to subsidize the majority rich to subsidize the minority poor. Even the UK, 30%, 35% of the UK lives in London in the southeast of England, which is therefore by far the majority. And about 25% live in the rest of England, and I'm excluding Scotland and Wales. And therefore, that, that, that area can think about subsidizing the other area. In a country like India, that is not true. And it also means that you have a tension between where the political power is and where the economic uh, uh, extraction and growth is happening. The only countries in the 20th century, finally, which were like us, do not exist anymore. Absolutely. One was the former I, Yugoslavia and the other was the former Soviet Union. I understand, I understand the nature of the tensions you're creating. India is becoming, in effect, two countries very separate to each other where you have huge differences that could lead to tension, that could lead to, as you said, challenges to the unity and integrity of India. Let me put, however, a contrary opinion to you. How do you respond to the view that India's economic growth of 8.2%, 7% and 8.7% for the last three years, if it continues, should guarantee that by 2047, India becomes Viksit Bharat as the Prime Minister has forecast. That, I assume, is the basis of the government's confidence. How do you respond to it? Well, first, if you do the math, no country in the world has grown consistently at... First, we are not growing at 8%. Let's get that absolutely straight. We are growing at less than 8%. We haven't grown at 8% for some time now, at least 15 years. And... Consistent economic growth at about 8.5 to 9% year after year, every year, is what is going to give you Vixit Bharat in 2047. Now, the features I'm mentioning will inhibit that from happening because of something the economists call the base effect. So if you're earning, let's say as a human being, if you're earning 2 lakh rupees a month and you want your income to grow by 10%, right? It means you need to grow from 2 lakhs to 2 lakhs 20. That is much more difficult to do than if your income is 8,000 rupees a month and you want to grow by 10%, in which case it has to grow from 8,000 to 8,800. 800 is much smaller than 20,000. So what will happen is that as the per capita income of the South goes up, if the per capita income of the late Indian plain does not go up commensurately, if extant conditions today continue to obtain, then it will, the, the growth rates of the South will begin to decelerate. And if the growth rates are not remain the same, we will not grow at 8%, we will not be mixed. In other we words, what you're, saying, what you're saying is the belief that we will grow at 8% is fallacious on two grounds. A, we haven't grown at 8% as you began by saying for 15 years. We're not growing at 8% now, regardless of the figures that the statistical department puts out. And secondly, you're saying to continue to grow at 8% for another 15 years is very difficult given the problems of the nature in which India is growing. That's why you say the belief the government has that we will inevitably become a Vixat country, a developed country by 2047 is fallacious and wrong. A quick yes or no? Inevitability is hubris. Yes. Okay. Let's at this point then come to what I believe is the core of your argument. It's basically this. Since 1991, India's growth has been fueled by a very narrow base of people, around 150 million, consuming very specific goods. Goods such as automobiles, two-wheelers, air conditioners, refrigerators, and general fast-moving goods. After 30 years, you say, this growth has plateaued. Secondly, you point out, it's not inclusive. It's limited to roughly 10-15% of the population. Now, for people who haven't heard this argument before, who haven't read your Economic Times article, can you briefly elaborate on that for us? Certainly. When, in 1991, I was uh, 24 years old, uh, I could literally either buy a Maruti 800 or a Fiat or an ambassador of one of those things. 
And to buy a Bharati 800 in 1991, 1990, as, as a lecturer in, in university uh, in India, briefly, uh, which was the same salary as the entry level salary of an IAS officer, they become richer later, but anyway, uh, was about 3,500 rupees a month. So broadly speaking, it would cost me three years salary to buy a Bharati 800. It would cost me 10 months salary to buy an air conditioner. Uh, today, the entry level salary of someone taking exactly that job is about 60,000 rupees a month. And a Maruti 800, or its equivalent, I'll do or something, costs about three and a half lakhs. So from three years salary, they can now afford a Maruti 800 just five years. An air conditioner, they can in fact afford with less than a month salary. And an airline ticket from Bombay to Delhi costs exactly the same as it did in 1991. So things have become much more affordable for the relatively affluent. That has fueled a massive upsurge in consumption, whether it is in air tickets or in cars or in two-wheelers or in what are called fast-moving consumer goods, you know, fridges and the like. And this has, in no small measure, contributed to India's increased growth, increased per capita income and increased per spend. But that can only go on for so long. There will be so many air conditioners will buy in your life. There are only so many airline journeys you will take in your life unless a number of people who are demanding these more prosperous things grows. So if you're confining this to the top 10 or 20 percent, then inevitably you're going to end up in a million income trap because then 75 percent of the population is not increasing its consumption at the same rate and pace as we have seen in our generation happening since 1991. That is the crux of the challenge that the middle income trap affords, which is why, to conclude, that, that when I came back to this country, for, uh, I keep coming back, when I came back to work here in 2013, I went and asked Bombay economists, you know, what are your leading indicators of the Indian economy? And they said, oh, cars and automobiles and airline tickets. I said, but what about food? What about textiles? What about like health? What about, you know, stuff that bicycles, stuff that, you know, not poor people, but relatively less well-off people consume. Why are they not your leading indicators of the simple answer was they're not because they're not what makes the economy tick. So we have to therefore transition in one of two ways. One is to make sure more people can afford cars. But in the interim, there are other things we can do which I can elaborate on later. You know, you make this point very cogently in your Economic Times article. You say, and I'm quoting you, the India story since 1991 has delivered great prosperity for the top 150 million. This has reached its limits because we are unable to craft a strategy that extends this to the next 200, 300 million people. And that is why we face this danger of a middle income trap. If we can't extend it to the next 200, 300 million, we'll be stuck in a middle income trap. But if we can, we'll have a way out of it. And the way out of it is what I want to come to. You say India must focus on producing goods, not just for the 150 million who are consuming, but for the 1.2 or 1.3 billion who are presently left out. And you identify five things which they need, which are food, textiles for clothing, an affordable house, health and education. Explain to the audience, why would it make such a big difference if instead of cars, refrigerators and fast moving goods, we were to concentrate on the production of food, textiles, an affordable house, health and education? A, why would it make a difference? And how would that ensure that the next 200, 300 million come into consumption? Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. You've actually hit the crux of the issue. So there are three reasons why I am advocating in the Indian context that we do not try and make sure that more people travel by air, one, because they don't have the money, and instead try and focus on things that they can consume and they can produce and earn income so that they can consume. North India is poorer than Nepal, the great Indian plain. It's also much less skilled than peninsular India. So how do I get jobs there? How do I get activities going there that can, you know, with a marginal uplift in skills, uh, improve employment, generate income, and therefore generate prosperity? It's not going to happen by setting up semiconductor factories. As you've seen in the papers, they will go to Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and for politically motivated reasons, eventually to Assam, we'll see. Uh, 
We are not going to see large scale manufacturing of luxury goods there because the demand is not there. So I asked myself, what does the common Indian want in their lifetime? And it struck me that the common, what the common Indian wants in their lifetime to purchase with money in their pocket without subsidy are things that don't require large degrees of skill. They want a non-subsidized, decent, nutritious meal. That requires policy change to make sure that agriculture is a functioning business, that poor farmers and the rural sector makes money. Now, 47% of people in agriculture agree is too high. But the moment agriculture begins to make money, you will begin to release people who are in agriculture because they have nothing else to do. And where will they move? I don't want them to keep moving to the South unless the South embraces them as one of their own. They will look for jobs ideally in their neighborhood, so they don't waste time traveling thousands of kilometers, as is currently the case, and immiserizing themselves. What kinds of jobs would they get? Well, how about clothing? That's the next thing a person wants, right? If they're poor. Not, 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 not sort of poor on, on the bread line, but poor in the sense they earn the minimum wage. So what's happening with clothing? I want to buy a 300 rupees shirt with what I earn. Interesting, this shirt I'm wearing costs 3,000 rupees. It's entirely made in India. It's made in Tirupur and Gujarat. But the shirts that cost 300 rupees are imported from Bangladesh and Vietnam because the wages in Tirupur and Gujarat are too high to make shirts that are cheaper than 3,000 rupees. But the wages to make 300 rupees shirts are not too high in the great Indian plain. And therefore, we can move people into making this second thing that the common person wants. The third thing the common person wants is housing. There's lots of policy changes we can do, and I can, I can go into great detail, I have elsewhere, on how to do this, but broadly speaking, I don't want a house with some subsidies as said in the article from some avas from the prime minister. People are fed up of handouts from the prime minister or the chief minister, etc. I want to be like you and me. I want to earn enough money to go and take a loan, pay EMIs, and build a house for my family. That would mean loan sizes and house prices of between 5 and 12 lakhs, depending on where you live in India, in, in the great Indian plain. Those are simply not available. There is credit for real estate booms and Ponzi schemes, there is no credit for housing. The fourth area is education. A decent education is something that is affordable, doesn't require any high skills, and is worth investing in. We are not able to provide it. And finally, a baseline healthcare system without subsidy, which people can afford to pay for, and which delivers baseline healthcare, is something that we should be providing, but we're not providing. So all our incremental prosperity is going into air conditioners and cars, and reaching away abroad into foreign holidays and foreign health and foreign education at the night of the day, while these things are not being produced. And these things, if produced, will raise the incomes of the next 250 million, will raise the incomes in the geographies that I want them raised, and will therefore preserve the unity and dignity of India and give our Vixit Bharat a push. But there is a hollow and complete silence on how we do these things on a commercial, non-subsidized basis, and that 